Um, we're going to be talking to you a little bit about simplifying the theme development process, uh, making it a little bit easier on yourself, um, covering a variety of topics, not uh, really too much detail, but I'll give you a good overview of how we develop a work together to develop a WordPress theme and to uh, you know see, see the project through the completion. So basically, a lot of it's going to be uh, working with uh, through collaboration and uh, setting yourself up with a clear process to follow. So again, uh, my name's Al, uh, I have 20 years in the IT field. I've been working with uh, web development for the last 15 years and probably working exclusively with Word WordPress within the, within the last year. Um, as I started doing freelance work though, my, my biggest problem was design. I knew nothing about design, I always struggled with it. I was really never happy with the results I got. So, um, you know, I would basically just um, throw things against the wall, whatever stock I went with, it kind of limited my ability to design. I have a few clunker sites, I will never admit I did, and I hope they just disappear and go away, you know, I never even, if uh, somebody asks me about them, no, not me. And the reason for that is that I never knew the rules, much less followed them, so there was no rules that I knew, so eventually I started working on some bigger projects, and when I did that, I started working with some in-house designers who uh, knew what they were doing, and what I found working with them was that the development process was a, was a lot easier for me. It was basically, I could focus on coding, I focused on my specialty, and I was able to exceed some of the boundaries I thought were really limiting for myself. And I also found that the development process was a lot easier and a lot faster. So I pretty much determined that I wanted to hook up with some designers and get out of the design business altogether and just focus on development exclusively. So I started going to meetups. I met a few designers, including Stephanie. Um, she had some interesting projects she was working on that involved WordPress, so I pretty much dove in uh, feet first when I uh, got involved with those. I got to try a lot of new things, got to really appreciate the capabilities of WordPress. So um, uh, along the way, I basically learned some time savers. I'm going to present them to you. We're going to, we're going to go through the, the workflow of uh, theme development and kind of, you know, illustrate what we do and maybe uh, give you some time saving techniques. But uh, before I do that, I'm going to introduce Stephanie, let her give you a little background about herself and tell you what she's all about. Thanks for the introduction, Al. I'm Stephanie Schechter, and I couldn't agree more that theme building is easier with collaborating with a developer and also having a clear process before you start. I wanted to give this talk because as a designer with limited coding skills, I had a hard time building custom, truly custom products in WordPress, but I found out that working with a developer that I could produce much better results for my projects. And I thought there might be some designers here today that could benefit from what I've learned and the, uh, and the processes that Al and I have come up with. So our goal for today is to show you the process that, that we use, and it has three main phases, the planning phase, the design phase, and the development phase. Just a little bit about me, I'm a I've been a designer for 18 years. My background is in industrial design and print design. I got into web freelance a few years ago because I wanted to work in an industry that had a little bit more, uh, a little bit more potential versus print or manufacturing, which I had been doing for years and I wanted more flexibility in my career. So, and I had been looking for, for work, for uh, web design freelance work, and I kept hearing about WordPress, and that it was in, I realized that it was in demand, which, which made me think I better learn this thing because it would mean more work for me. But as some of the designers in the room might know, when you're starting in WordPress and you're starting working with the existing themes, you might waste a little, I, I wasted a lot of time searching for the perfect theme or um, finding a theme that I thought looked cool and then modifying it, but none of what I was doing was really custom. And I felt that it really hindered my creativity because I couldn't build a site completely from scratch. So my limited coding skills was really limiting the, the work I was able to produce in WordPress. And I wasted a lot of time sifting through the unnecessary code that came with the themes and a lot of trial and error to get things to look the way I wanted and had a lot of conflicts um, with plugins and things and I'm sure a lot of you have experienced some of that. Um, I brushed up on my HTML and CSS skills and got to know the basic concepts of PHP but 
as many of the designers in the room might know, JavaScript is like a whole other animal. It like takes a whole other type of brain to be able to <laughs> think <laughs> to think in that way. And that's when I really realized if I wanted to keep working in WordPress that I better find some help. Um, so that led me to the decision to find a developer, um, which would allow me to focus on what I was good and efficient at, which is graphic design, information architecture, and branding. Um, and like many of you, I'm sure that you want to be confident with the, the products that you're selling your clients and do really custom work with more sophisticated features and better coding. Um, and from my experiences of working with the developer, it turns out that WordPress is really ideal for a designer-developer collaboration because of the at the access to the files of everything being in a central location and the, that the fact that there is a consistent framework that works really well for coming up with a standardized process for all your sites that you can that you can use not only from project to project but all the, also from developer to developer so it really works out great um, so if you want to find a developer I recommend getting the word out that you're looking for somebody um, to build custom themes with. That's what I did and I, I got quite a bit of response. I posted on some online forums and also went to the local um, meetups for web development and WordCamp of course is a great place to <coughs> meet WordPress developers. Um, just make sure you find somebody that has front and back end coding skills. I found that that's really important because it it means that they can really cover all the bases and it takes pressure off of you to, um, to, to set up your own CSS and your own front-end framework. The person doesn't need to be local, I found that working through email, Skype, PayPal, everything works great just fine. So, I mean, Elle and I, we hardly ever see each other in person and it works out just fine. Um, I recommend when you do find a developer, test them out first on unpaid work. Um, before you have a client project where there are deadlines and expectations because there's always going to be some issues with communication that you're going to want to work out um, and you want to find out if you can communicate with the person well, if they're reliable. Um, so I recommend working on projects for your portfolio, projects for friends, or themes that you might want to distribute. And um, I'll yeah, for me, what I looked for when I was looking for a designer was, it was real simple. I was basically looking for somebody that was good at design, obviously, but also had some coding and some technical knowledge. They knew how to, their way around a style sheet, they knew their way around HTML. We really didn't expect them to know too much about programming. Um, just, just the fact that they understood the technology and the coding, so kind of like keep them grounded and keep uh, everything in a real, realistic uh, sort of fashion. Um, myself, um, what, I, what I found is that I started learning, I, I do project management also, and I, start, I try to learn a little bit about what everybody on the team does, so I want to know what the database guys are doing, the network guys are doing, design is doing, so I learn a little bit about design, just so I can understand, I can help the designer out when I can. I mean, I'm by no means a designer, I would never attempt to do a design unless somebody really begged me and paid me a ton of money, um, otherwise I want to avoid it like the plague, really. But I do know Photoshop, I know image editing theory, I know how to create images and how to optimize them and things and such like that. So I help out a lot in that aspect, you know, some of the some of the more menial tasks as far as design goes. Um, what's also helpful working with the team, obviously, is uh, being open to constructive criticism. Um, you know, there's a lot of ways where you're biased get with your work and it's tough to really hear something negative or maybe even uh, critical of it, not so much negative. But the point is, obviously, you don't want to be a baby, you want to be kind of flexible and understand that people are giving you this advice for a reason, and, uh, you know, it's usually helpful and it's not insulting, so, you know, you just look past it and try to take it for what it's worth and, you know, use your way, way out the options that you have. And also, um, don't, don't force compromise, obviously. Uh, as a developer, I wouldn't think of taking a designer's work and try to say, okay, no, I want this element over here and I'm going to put it over here. Why? Because it's easier, you know, and, um, if I have to do it that way, i got to get crazy with floats and I don't want to bother with that, you know. It's really not fair to the designer if you agreed upon a design to ask them to compromise, you know, their professionalism in any way. So I, I keep it like that. I get a mock-up, I mock it up, and I do the final product as perfectly as possible. If there's some reason why you can't match the design and it's not feasible, then 
you talk about it and work through that part of it. Um, the benefits of it all, again, is um, I'm working in my comfort zone. I'm not, I'm not guessing, I'm not staring at a blank screen trying to wonder what it's going to look like or looking at some other work and trying to lift, you know, trying to say, oh, that looks good, I'll try that now. Tired of that. So I got the, once I stopped worrying about designing, I broke a lot of new ground. I found my coding uh, got a lot more efficient, got a lot more sophisticated, and um, it, it was just all around breaking new ground left and right. And uh, a, a lot better quality, and the sites that we were doing were a much better creativity because I wasn't working within my own limitations. I was working like basically as somebody who knew what they were doing, um, and then making that site basically sing and dance. And um, also another good thing about working with somebody else is you get the you know mix contacts. Obviously, they get work, you get work, you kind of can sub each other out, and <coughs> all that other stuff. So anyway. Uh, when we get started, we're going to start uh, going through the workflow of uh, development of the theme. So the projects that Stephanie and I have worked on, uh, she's usually been the initiator. It's, uh, she's had all the, she's had a three, four, five projects that we've worked on together so far. So she's always the one that's pretty much the lead on it. So I'm going to let her get started with the uh, planning and analysis part of it all. Okay, so the planning phase, which is the the, be the beginning of the project. Designers, it's your, it's your job to, de to define the scope for the developer clearly. And I recommend doing this in a visual way instead of a verbal way because it's going to leave less up to interpretation. Um, so you're going to want to create an overview to show the developer. And you can do this with, with two different documents. You're going to want to start with a site map, which is just going to show the, um, the amount of pages the hierarchy of the pages, just the relationship of the pages to each other. It just helps the developer get an idea of what you're, of what you're envisioning for the overall scope of the site and, um, and what's going to be involved. Then the other document are wireframes. And they can be pretty simple. Um, what the wireframe is going to do is just communicate the functionality of the page. You're not going to worry about graphic design yet. This is just going to be a stick figure drawing of some individual pages. And this is going to help you communicate what the links are, what the features are, is there a sidebar, are there JavaScript animations, anything that the developer might need to know. Um, but don't get bogged down in design details yet. This is just purely layout and function. This is going to allow, allow for the developer to start prototyping the site while you're doing the styling. And this is going to save a lot of time up front with the project. Um, I, do my, I do my wireframes in Photoshop, but there are a lot of apps available to create wireframes. Um, a popular one is Balsamic, but you can do it many ways. You can even do it on paper. Um, so it, it really doesn't matter It just how you make the wireframe. It's just that you want to use it to communicate what the functionality is. So once I've got the wireframe and the sitemap done, that's when I start the collaboration with the developer. So I'm going to show it to him. We're going to have a conversation. Um, I'm going to get his feedback and his concerns. And designers, I, I know for me, sometimes this is difficult. But you really need to be humble and listen to their concerns. Because if you don't listen to their concerns at this point, you might be really sorry later. Because if they're telling you, don't, just because the, you think the idea may look cool, it might not actually function the way you think it's going to. So talk to them, get their feedback, and really try and troubleshoot and problem solve with them before you get into the project um, because it's going to make for a better final product. And also, once they've gotten a look at the sitemap and the wireframe, they'll be able to give you an estimate of the time and cost involved in producing the site. Um, and just know a little enough about your, the concepts of coding so you can have an educated conversation with them. So you're going to want to know what PHP and JavaScript do, but you don't have to know how to write in them. Um, it just helps you, helps you understand what the developer is telling you, and it helps you if, if they say something isn't possible, you want to be able to understand why. It's just going to help you learn and grow and be able to um, produce better sites. 
I learned a lot about my web, uh, website planning process from, um, from an online school called The School, S-K-O-O-L. It's great for project ma learning project management and, um, and the process behind building websites, but not the technical process. It's the, um, it's the strategy behind building websites. Yeah, for me, uh, the planning analysis phase usually starts with a conversation. Before I even go near a computer, I like to talk about um, what the designer has in mind or whoever the stakeholder happens to be at the time. Um, the reason is you get to keep it realistic. Um, I, Stephanie's also often come up to me and said, hey, is this possible? Do you think we could uh, possibly have an unlimited scrolling feature on there? And I'd be like, yeah, sure. I can't tell you how to do it right now, but I'm, it's pretty possible. So, you know, I take the time during that phase to go and do some research, get my pseudocode into place maybe, and uh, you know, go from there. Uh, again, I'd like to keep it grounded and keep it in conversation. Once I get a mock-up like Stephanie had on before, I'm gonna take it and make my own mock-up. It looks something like that. I told you, I'm not a designer. <laughs> but to me, that it works for me. I like doing everything on paper. Um, the hand to brain thing works well with me. And what I'm doing is I'm basically taking her mock-up and redrawing it on graph paper. And documenting all the dimensions on that. Eventually, um, I'm keeping everything in pixels. Eventually, I'm going to be converting everything into percentages. And it's uh, similar to the theory that Ethan Mockhart uh, illustrates in this book on responsive web design. It's basically just uh, converting pixels into percentages. So when you get a screen resized, it resized proportionately until you hit certain points where your content breaks. And when it does, um, you know, you got to set up media queries. But I'll touch on a little bit about that later. Before I even get into the uh, conversion of percentages, though, what I'm doing is I am creating HTML and CSS mockups, uh, prototypes rather, um, keeping the measurements constant, seeing that everything works. Basically, it's, there's no content in there; it's just borders or shaded areas or whatnot, and it, it allows me to get a visual again, uh, document to whatever's whatever's on the screen, whatever's taking taking up space. I got to think that there's going to be a measurement for it, uh, whether it's a div or a span or an image area, text area, header, whatever, any anything like that. I got to, you know, kind of keep that in the back of my mind. So I kind of put little placeholders up there on there within the HTML. Um, once the once the design is locked, the layout I got on the prototype, I'll kind of take it a little bit. This is a little basic what I do. I start off with pixels and then eventually convert everything into percentages. You know the. The outside container would obviously be 100%, and then the internal content container would be based on a calculation on, you know, depending on what type of dimensions you have set in there. Um, after this is all set, I'll set up a staging area online somewhere and talk to the designer. We set up constraints, not just for myself, but also for the designer. The designer needs to be able to, you know, it's, it's basically their, their idea to begin with, but there's also constraints that they're going to have to follow, you know, and they pretty much keep it within that prototype make sure everything works. I, I like to think anything is possible, but you know, reality hits you in the face sometimes at the most inconvenient times, and it's usually when uh, the deadline's approaching. Mm -hmm. So try to keep it real at the very beginning. Um, next part <laughs> is basically the design phase. Um, I take a break and go fishing, and I wait to hear back from Stephanie. <laughs> <laughs> he does. Okay, so um, I'm going to talk to the design phase. This is where you're going to want to communicate with the developer exactly what you want the site to look like. So once you've got your visual language all done and you know what your fonts and your colors and your iconography and all that stuff are, you're going to, what I, what I do, the way I do it is um, ex I start with example pages in Photoshop. Um, doing it with, uh, la doing a layered Photoshop file with an organized hierarchy of layers and layered groups is really helpful for the developer to be able to dissect. Um, and I do it so the layer groups all relate to sections of the page. It just makes it easier for them to understand what they're looking at when they get your file. I also use grid templates, which are very helpful. Um, they create a consistency amongst your pages and they help you define exact measurements of what you're expecting, so the developer knows how, um, how big each area should be on the site. I use a 960 grid for desktop. 
that's a that is a grid that's designed to look good on all ma on all monitors. And I've also been experimenting lately with mobile templates um, for responsive. And again, it's just it's just another tool to help you communicate exactly what you want the site to look like. For typography, we um, we've been using FontScroll.com when we can. The fonts are <laughs> fonts are free, but you have to check the licensing terms because and make sure they're appropriate for your usage. It provides at font face files for your CSS, but it also has the desktop versions of the fonts, which is really helpful because you can use the actual fonts in your quote in your example pages uh, that you're planning to use on the site. And that again, it also helps communicate with the developer exactly what you want the site to look like. What was that font site? It's fontsquirrel.com. And the other recommendation I have is this has been really helpful for for us to keep things organized is to use an online um, project management app like Basecamp. We had started with emailing files back and forth, and things were getting lost in the shuffle, and it was hard to remember what the what the latest version was. But having all of our our example pages and all of our files and all of our content files in one central place has been really, really helpful. Um, and Basecamp, for example, has a calendar feature and to-do lists and where it helps us be able to set milestones for the project and keep the project organized. And so once we, once I have my example pages, I'm going to pass them along to Al and the development phase is going to get started. So I'm back from fishing. And I look at Basecamp and I see that there's a Photoshop file up there. Basically all the layers are um, you know, pretty much laid out for me and separated. Um, I'm going to take that uh, Photoshop file and pretty much chop it up into only necessary images. I'm going to keep in consideration that some images I might not want to use, I might be able to get away using CSS if there's a gradient or shadows or whatnot. Um, I try to use as little images as possible just to keep the site light and you know, not too heavy. And, Ability to load a lot faster. So uh, if I can make a, if I can do without an image, I try to do that. You know, I try to avoid images that are solely text and you know, <coughs> simple strategies like that. Um, I learned this the hard way, the very hard way, and it was very painful. But start small. If you're going to be designing a responsive website, start with a mobile size screen, and then work your way up. Okay. The reason I found was I started with the desktop size screen and tried to compress it, and it was a nightmare. And uh, I had a lot of elements that I was using in desktop that I wasn't going to be using in mobile, so it was kind of a little bit of a pain. So I found since then that working from mobile, where you're using a limited amount of elements, and then going to tablet, and then going to desktop, or whatever your breakpoints are going to be set at, it's much easier and much less painful. You know, by the time you get to the desktop size, you're simply adding elements that are, you know, that won't be called in the uh, mobile site. So it's a lot much easier. Also keeps your code uh, minimized. And I look at it like uh, kind of like you're designing multiple sites. So I'll have separate style sheets for uh, the mobile site, separate style sheet for the tablet, separate style sheet for the desktop, and then eventually at the very, you know, at the end when I implement it into a WordPress site, I'll uh, combine everything all, you know, using media queries. I'll combine it all into one one style sheet and then just uh, work off of that. Uh, after I start doing, uh, after I uh, stop. With the template, the pseudocode, I'm basically going to uh, migrate my HTML into the WordPress template files. So I'm going to start off with the header file. Usually I start off with a, a starter header file, like in the top left over there. And um, it's blank, it's really got not much to it. As I go along, I'm adding my PHP scripting. Uh, I've got a, a page specific there, so it looks for the home page, send certain style sheets to that. Uh, I've got some jQuery I'll throw in there. I might create some div elements. Everything, basically anything that's consistent across every page on the website, I'm throwing in the header. I think of the header as being the brains of the website, so any type of scripting or programming, I'm throwing it in the header. That's I've started to find as I develop WordPress themes, most of my work is done in the header, and you know you think it's on the index file, but to me it's really not. Most of most of my headache and most of the time is spent on this header again, this header thing to work right. Once I get that all set up, you know with the menu items also go in there, I'm going to work on my, my index file. Now, my index file, I found, is I do the exact opposite of what I do with the header. Rather than adding things, 
on taking things away out of the index file. So the index content is basically controlled from the WordPress uh, dashboard that you log on to online. So all the content you're entering in there and the menus are basically created in there. So what I do with this, when I, especially when I do a non-blogging site, which is mostly what I've been doing for a while, uh, I'm taking comments away. I don't, obviously, I don't want to have to add comments. I don't need to have a date on every time I make an update to the page. Um, I'm removing some not found, sorry page not found. Anything I, anything that's getting in my way of the of the purpose of the site. I'm just I'm just commenting on it. I'm not really deleting it. I'm just taking it away in case I want to, you know, throw it in there later on. I, I can just simply uncomment it if I happen to need it at that time. Um, after I get this set up, then I'm going to start getting into my style sheets. All right, so. The style CSS you create is the main style sheet. It's required as part of the template. And uh, that's going to basically have my desktop layout. Even though I say develop from mobile on up, my desktop layout is going to be the default style CSS until it might change someday where most people are going to be looking at sites on tablet side screens and desktop is going to be obsolete, whatever, who knows. Until that happens, the desktop is going to be my default style sheet. And then I'm going to use a media query style sheet for the tablet size screens and uh, any other type of breakpoints I set. Um, iPads are a 1024 screen, so that's why I use that one. And then other tablets are usually a 768 width or whatever, or portrait size, you know, you keep it in mind. So you just set up your breakpoints, you know, uh, 769 pixels to 1024. There's your style for that size screen. When it finds uh, from a phone size, which is 320, to a portrait tablet size, and then I get the phone, uh, the mobile size at the very end. And you know, your media queries are probably going to be a lot bigger and longer than this. I just abbreviated it for uh, to fit on the slide, so give you an idea. I'm not going to get into too much detail. I could spend all weekend talking about responsive design. There's a ton of good stuff about that. Actually, um, this today I think there's a talk. At, there's a talk at four o'clock by Chris Cochran. He's giving a talk on uh, going mobile from 960 to 320, and then at 12:30 tomorrow, Jesse Friedman is going to be doing a responsive design talk as well, so they'll give you a lot more detail, and there's a ton of stuff online, that Ethan Marcotte book is great for that. Um, once I'm done with my style sheets, everything looks good, um, I spend most of the time I find on the style sheets, I'm going to start uh, tweaking my content, meaning uh, getting the menu set up, getting the menu styled as well, uh, adding any extra content into the pages, installing my plugins, testing out the plugins. Um, one thing I also got to say is also, you know, Probably had a million times this weekend, but donate if you're using a plugin. Donate to the developer if it's a free one. Uh, they're the Jedi of this community, so they're, they're the ones that really make this WordPress thing happen. So it's a good idea when whenever you're done with a site and you're using one of their plugins, uh, slip them a few bucks if you get a chance. Um, so then we're done. No, no. <laughs> then I get then I call Stephanie up and say we're done, and she looks at it and has a whole another ball game, right? <laughs> well, he usually doesn't. I usually don't wait until he says he's done. Actually, um, you're going to want to check in frequently with your developer, for sure. Um, you're not going to want last minute surprises. And you're going to want to keep looking for any instances where the, what he's doing doesn't match with your specs. Um, and just don't assume that they're going to notice any inconsistencies or, or even functionality issues, because their head is in the code. So just keep checking in, look for anything that's looking or, or working funny, and don't worry about being a nag. I mean, this is, you know, I can't stress this enough. If you, you want to produce a professional product in the end, and if they're a professional, and they really want to have a good product, and they want you to be satisfied with it, they are not going to be, um, they, they should be cool with you calling them and saying, you know, what, why is this looking funny, you know, and he may say, I'm getting to that, or he might say, oh, I didn't notice that, but it never hurts to bring it to their attention before he gets to his testing phase. Um, and it does help to know your CSS and your HTML, like Al said in the beginning, um, just so you can make any tweaks to, any, make little styling tweaks yourself, to add content yourself, and in some cases this might save you time when, while the developer is working on something else, or it could you know, even save you money. Um, and when he is tells me he's close to done, I'm going to want to check every page and every link and look for anything at all that looks a little bit off or isn't work, working the way I think it should be working and discuss those functionality issues with him. And I want to do that before he's, um, 
before he's done with his testing phase so he doesn't have to go through it twice. Yeah, this, every time I always think I'm done with this, uh, Stephanie always finds something and it's a good thing because I end up being biased. I hate testing. The testing part of this is my least favorite because I'm exhausted. I want this project to be over with. You know, it's <laughs> tedious and it's whatever. You think you're done and then you get hit in the face and you realize, oh, you've got another 20 hours of work in front of you. So, um, Stephanie's good at being very detail oriented, so um, it helps me get the testing out where some things I, I miss a lot of things. Like I said, I'm biased to the work. I pretty much just want to get it done. Um, I usually test throughout the uh, the whole development process. I don't, um, you know, I don't do it extensively till the very end. What I what I want to make sure to do though is um, before I even begin my testing is I want to make sure my code's clean. Every code that I use or a style sheet that I use should have a purpose for it. What happens? When you're developing, is uh, you're trying different things. Okay, I'm gonna try using a float here. That a float don't work. Okay, maybe I'll use a margin. Maybe I'll do this. A position absolute position. Relative. And before you know, you got a bunch of junk in there that you forgot to take out because you're trying to trying a bunch of uh, different things. And that causes a lot of incompatibilities. The browser you're developing off of might look great, but then you look at an IE, and of course it looks like crap because IE makes everything look like crap. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so you know, going through your code, going through your style sheet. Um, Making sure everything is there for a purpose and it's done correctly and it's nice and clean and efficient is very helpful before you design to save you a ton of headaches. Um, also, obviously, make sure your to-do list is empty. You don't want to start testing when uh, you know. Oh, I got an about page to do, or you know, I still got to do a contact page because you're gonna end up doing all that and then have to do the testing process again. So. Um, after, after uh, you get code clean, you go through all your browsers, obviously you do the big major browsers that you're going to be working on, test it on the phone, if you have a tablet, that's great, uh, testing on different <coughs> devices is great. I don't have a tablet, I got a phone, and uh, I got a computer and a laptop, and that's it. So um, I use the screen resize thing, you know, this has to give you a rough idea on how things are going to look on different size screens by doing that. Also, I'll go to a site similar to something like this, Screenfly, or other similar sites like Quirk Tools. And what they do is they have a lot of options, different desktop screen sizes, they have uh, different tablet screen sizes that you can check out with different manufacturers. Samsung uses a different size than iPad would use, say. Also mobiles and uh, TVs are becoming big with Roku now out there. You're gonna be, a lot of people are going to be surfing the webs a lot. Uh, I even saw a coffee table that's like a computer nowadays. So um, a lot of different devices are going to be coming out. Uh, gradual resize too, you want to test a breakpoint if you're using the percentage uh, layout uh, settings. When you gradually resize, you're going to watch your content. It's going to look nice to a certain point, then all of a sudden it's going to fall outside the container or whatever. It's going to go haywire at some point. Those are considered breakpoints. Again, you can compensate with those using media queries. Um, testing the links. This is the fun part. It's like testing every single page on every single browser, on every single device, over and over and over again. That's why I hate doing this. But, you know, it's kind of necessary. You know, don't just do, obviously, don't just look at your home page. And you know, as soon as you're done, you got to test every every page. And if it's a huge site, you know, I've worked with you know 100 page sites where you got a team of people testing, and you know, you just split it up, and everybody has to has their own part to do. Last thing I test is the performance. That's the speed and uh, actual functionality of the site. Okay, I make sure that's the very last thing because I want to get all the other issues straightened out. Um, the way I test with that is uh, I'll use YSlow. It's a plugin for Chrome. And basically, you just plug it. Uh, you install it in Chrome. You go to your home page, click the little icon in the type, top right, and it gives you a report card A through F. You know, and uh, wherever you get an F's, you uh, try to improve upon. It gives you little tips. And that that really helps you out um, uh, to to make your site pretty much uh, running effectively. And then you're done. No, no. you're gonna show it to the to the client, right? And then they're gonna say, Oh, I got a whole different idea. I'm gonna change this completely. <laughs> anyway, uh, that's usually how it goes. That's right? a whole other talk. Yeah, right, that's a whole other talk. We've got a couple of minutes for questions if anybody has any. Be glad to help you. Yeah. Could you uh, use the mic? Oh, yeah, sorry. Can I use the mic? Sure. Yeah. Hi. Uh, just to clarify your, your process, you mentioned responsive theming. Mm -hmm. um, are you going in the beginning of the planning phase, or are you doing wireframes for? For all your um, expected sizes for tablets, for phones, expected devices. Yeah, expected devices. Are you talking about that, or is that more informal? Um, Clarify. 
I do do that. I, when I when I do uh, develop for mobile sites, yes, I do create a, a wireframe for every device that I work on. Um, I do it like I showed you on the graph paper, you know, and then I'll show it to Stephanie. Stephanie will give me a mock-up or a des whatever designer I happen to be working with. They'll give me a mock-up of the actual screenshot of what the design looks like. So yeah, we do definitely consider that during the planning phase. Stephanie, do you? I can talk. All right, go ahead. Stephanie, do you design the mobile first, also, or do you design the desktop and then the mobile? That is a great question. <laughs> <laughs> I have been doing the desktop first, but I'm going to be starting to do it the other way. It's not so much important with designers; it's right. more of a development thing to keep your uh, code kind of clean. Anybody else? Yes. Um, the They're recording the presentation. When you're trying to get the job in the very beginning, when do you bring the developer in to, I mean, how do you cost it out if you don't know his part first? Like, that is a, that's a great question. Um, sometimes we do have a phone conversation to get a general idea before the wireframes, but sometimes I'll actually do the wireframe before, um, while do a quick wireframe in order to get an estimate from him before I give the proposal to the client. Yeah. What she does, she usually has a preliminary meeting. She'll have a preliminary meeting with the client and get a good idea. That won't give him a price on the spot. You know, go back, think about it, talk to me. That's when we do the discussion and I'll, I'll give her a rough estimate of what I'm looking for. Uh, it usually doesn't fall outside what we originally discussed. There's usually no surprises or how we make adjustments based on that. Yeah. Do you do you add a percentage in case of emergency? Oh yeah, always pay. Always. Oh, always pay. <laughs> <laughs> get a fifty percent down payment too. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. Like how much? And do don't launch before you get the final payment. Yeah. Exactly. That's a good point. Thank you. We could do a whole talk on lessons learned the hard way. <laughs> question. Um, are you using your media queries uh, in the head of the document of the header PHP or are you putting it in your CSS? Um, you could do it either way. The correct way is using a separate CSS style sheet. Um, what I do is uh, I found that um, my sites are certainly page specific so if, if there's a responsiveness in there I just put a, a responsive uh, media query. I put that right in the header above everything else. We, we call in the style sheet. So you, you call the responsive style sheet the same way you would um, you know, the regular style sheet. So would you put that above your styles.css call or no, after? Um, no, after. I usually put that after. So I saw in your example you use that import. Uh, Is that not how you're, using, you're doing it then? Uh, I don't remember which one that was. You had your styles.css file up and it looked like an at import of your Yeah, media. that was something I slapped together. Okay. That so I just want to clarify. Yeah, that, I just threw that together. Mm -hmm. I went to Dreamweaver, opened up a blank document, and just started typing. That's okay. really, that's not something mm -hmm. I'm So really you're putting using. that, I, I work in Joomla, that's why I'm, it's a little bit of a different mm -hmm. way of building a custom template. So okay. you put the media query in the header of the header.php file. Oh, all right. No. Is, that, is that what you're saying? The media query in the header of the header. Oh, so there's the head and then the body oh, okay, in the yeah. document? Yeah, well, with this, it's a separate file. So the header is a separate file <coughs> right together. So the header PHP and then okay. index PHP. So yeah, everything goes into the header PHP. And the head section, is that what you're talking about? Correct. In the head yeah. Yes. So that's where you would bring in all your different styles. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Anybody else? All right. Turn you loose, guys. Have fun this week. Oh, oh, sorry. One, more one more question. So I had a question. Oh. <laughs> <Damn>. <laughs> I had a question about when you're when you're designing. This is, what, this is a design question. Sure. When you're designing for the multiple templates that are inside of the WordPress file, do you also create um, the uh, the wireframe for that, or you just do that more in the Photoshop area? If there are if there are major differences amongst the pages, so if there are a lot of different page styles, I will do wireframes for the um, for a variety of pages to show him. So you know, I have a general idea if there's anything weird on the contact page or you know anything that's out of you know that would have 
functionality that may be a JavaScript issue or anything like that, it would definitely make a separate wireframe for that as well. Right. And the example pages would be the same, where I'd have example pages for the different types of pages. So it would make a Photoshop document of the contact page and stuff like that. Yep. All right. Well, we ran out of time, so guys, thanks a lot. Have fun this weekend. We'll see you around.